What is your name? My name is Anthony Poole. And are you an expert in mic microbes or bacteria or um, DNA or what? I guess my, my background is molecular evolution. Molecular evolution. Yes. Oh, good. And are we alone in the universe? Uh, well, we don't know the answer, but um, my guess is maybe not, but I don't know. <laughs> Your guess is maybe not if you don't know. Okay, yeah. so when you say maybe not, what, what is that based on? Well, um, it seems that we have a, an enormous... We've not been looking very long. We've got this enormous universe. We're just starting to figure out ways to look. We don't really know how to look properly yet, um, so I'm glass half full, and I suspect there were just sheer probabilities, there's going to be something out there, but, um, yeah. So the I'm probability means there's a lot of places to lots look. Lots of places to look, lots of, uh, we're discovering lots of planets, all these things that are really not my field, but there's plenty of uh, excitement, and I'm in the optimistic camp. But a lot of people who are looking for exoplanets say, okay, we've done our job, there's, there are places everywhere. Yes. Now you do your job, tell us what the probability of life evolving is. Right, yeah. So what's your estimate of that? It must be high because you said you suspect yes, that we're not alone. Um, well, I, I think we don't know the answer to that because we haven't figured out how to make life yet in the laboratory. But we have, in the last hundred years, we have gone uh, very, very close compared to where we were simply a hundred years ago. I think we, we, it might not be uh, impossible to imagine that we will get to a point where we understand the processes that give rise to life. Then, once we can generate that kind of data, uh, we may have a better understanding of what kinds of conditions it could arise in, um, whether there are multiple ways it could happen, so we can start approaching that scientifically. You said give rise to life rather than gave rise to life. Did I? You did. <laughs> I'm, wondering, I'm wondering if there's a distinction in your mind. No, no. N no, not particularly. Um, I guess I'm thinking about it. Yeah, maybe I'm thinking about ex <coughs> experiments. So uh, you know, my lab runs a. Um, we do experimental evolution, and we're interested in saying, well, we if we observe certain things in, um, you know, in a biological organism, and we we try to understand how that uh, feature evolved. Um, uh, one way of looking at that is that, oh, that was an extremely rare chance event and, and something magical was required for that event to happen. Another is to say, well, if, if we can understand the process by which it evolved, then we may get to a point where we can recreate that. So if there are ideas on how something may have evolved, you, you can test them in the laboratory. So I'm thinking, you know, at the moment we're doing things like uh, trying to understand, you know, why the four bases of DNA, why A, G, C, and T. Um, we think that you may have been an intermediate, and we're trying to evolve a cell that has U as its fourth base instead of T. If we can do that, we understand a process, and we can then understand more about whether it's a, a, a rare special event or whether it's a common thing, um, and that will move us closer to a point where perhaps in the future we'll start getting at that question of how easy is it to evolve life? Um, in the question, are we alone, what does we mean? Well, I guess I took it in the broadest sense of um, is there other life in the universe? Um, okay. And what does alone mean? Uh, are we the only instance of life uh, to have emerged in the universe? So if we, we don't need to find a communicating intelligent life form in order not to be alone? Uh, well, I guess it depends what you what you really want to uh, to know. Uh, for me personally, as a scientist, uh, I, I'm very interested in the the processes. If if we can understand whether the uh, yeah, my hunch that the process of life emerging is not a very uh, rare uh, or special event, then that's a good answer for me personally. Being able to communicate with another um, species is a, a different question again. Um, that would be even more interesting in, in some ways. Well, let's talk about this hunch, because uh, m most of the people I've interviewed are astronomers. They mm -hmm. don't have any kind of hunch at all, but you're a biologist dealing with biology and mm -hmm. the origin of life. So you said you had a hunch that it's not rare. Tell us, tell us, tell us give us a look inside your brain on that one. Okay. So... Um, what do I think? I think that uh, well, we see these these uh, molecules um, 
that uh, we normally call organic all over the place outside of Earth. Uh, so clearly we can produce through you know, chemical or uh, processes that are non-biological, quite complex um, molecules. And many of those molecules are the building blocks for life. Um, so the ingredients of life are everywhere. The ingredients of life are everywhere. Okay. The, um, so what about the recipe? The recipe, I mean, we don't know the recipe yet, but we, we understand what's in the recipe. We don't know how to do the recipe yet. Um, but I, I, have a, um, I have a sense that uh, if we keep working at that, we will get a better understanding of whether it's a um, process that we can understand the parameters of, like under which conditions will we see something emerging that we would be comfortable as biologists calling life. Uh, and are you making progress on that? I think we're making um, some progress in the sense that we, we understand things that uh, and we can measure things that we couldn't do decades ago. So tools like the synthetic biology tools that allow you to manipulate systems are a starting point. Um, but, but what part of what you're learning tells you that feeds that hunch that it's not rare? I think if it's rare and requires a special uh, explanation, um, then it's it's very difficult to study. Um, well, English language is presumably rare, and we can understand how it got here, but no one would expect to, to find it elsewhere. It's so quirky. So the mm -hmm. question is: Is life in that category, or why? But you're obviously putting life in a, in a more generic category. Well, I'd say yeah, sure. English language is a special instance of language, but if you look at languages in uh, you know, every single human being on this planet speaks some language or other or uses a sign language and there are languages and no other appearing. species speaks a human no language. one no one else does that's certainly true so uh, maybe no other planet in the universe speaks English it's life. well it's possible right but uh, do we do we think that uh, forms of communication would be so rare that uh, they would never appear again we see plenty of examples of communication between other species. We don't call them languages, and they may be not as advanced, but certainly the more general phenomenon of communication is common, and you could argue may have appeared multiple times on Earth. Right. But that's, I'm pushing back on the idea that life is a general thing. Maybe it's a specific thing like English. Right, and if it were a very specific thing, then you know we have to say, and then there was some magic, and that's not a very... Well, there was no magic in the origin of English. That's not magic. It's well, just if quirky. we say we don't understand it and it was so so special, then we're maybe we're we're not really thinking about ways to answer the question. Well, you we think of you. You're an organism. You're a Homo sapien, mm -hmm. and you say, oh, you know, we're Darwinian evolution. You know, our ancestors mm -hmm. used to be monkeys, and that's very quirky and interesting. Right. But there's nothing magical about it. But you wouldn't go looking for Anthony Poole on another planet. No, you wouldn't. So that's, that's, a, that's all yeah. I'm trying to. Is it possible that life is in that category? Of being so I, I don't. I that, don't think so. I mean, I think why, there could why? be. Well, I think there could be a, a really interesting thing that maybe uh, we're not thinking about as much as we we could do um, is that um, we're used to thinking about the, the kinds of biological systems that I study based on various uh, um, organic polymers and and with a with a membrane and so on, but uh, it's it's entirely possible uh, that we may have created the conditions wherein digital forms of life have appeared already uh, and we haven't really gone looking for them within our computer systems. We know we can see elements of that. We, you know, memes are a good example of that, mm -hmm. right? They, they spread, uh, they compete for the attention of the individuals that are looking at those and um, you know, any meme that I write tends to die off pretty quickly, but somebody who's, who's got, got a bit of an idea about how to write a, a viral meme, that will spread. It will change over time. Um, so we know that some of these processes, like evolution, uh, uh, can occur in non-biological ways. But I don't think we've really gone and said, okay, let's go look, look across the, uh, the um, World Wide Web and see if there are examples of something. What would we even consider a, a, life, a digital based life form? Well, about half the biologists I talk to think that viruses are alive, and half of them think they're not. Yep. And I think only maybe 5 to 10% think memes are alive. What right. do you think? Well, I think that memes and viruses are very similar uh, in terms of the way they operate. They, they need a, a host uh, as part of their rep uh, 
their mechanism of reproduction. Um, they don't do it independently. Um, don't we all need hosts? Well, you could argue, yeah, almost no life on Earth is truly independent. There might be a few, um, you know, bacteria that can eke out a life uh, directly from rocks uh, with an energy source directly in the rock. Um, but, you know, the, almost certainly all things are connected to some degree. That's maybe less important than understanding what it is that we would, you know, would I be happy if, if, if I don't know, a... Um, if there was a uh, sample return from Mars and we said the only thing we found is viruses, I think that would be a pretty strong indicator of life. So I would be quite happy with that. How about if you only found memes? <laughs> <laughs> that would be kind of interesting. <laughs> you can see that meme already. We went to the red planet and we, find, we found were memes. Yeah. Is the question, are we alone, an important question? Yeah, I think so. I mean, if, if you think every civilization, every small group of people that is... Uh, um, ever sort of sat up and looked at the stars after a full meal has asked these questions about the, the world around them. This is just natural human curiosity. We should be asking those questions at some point. It's important to us, uh, and maybe for some of us we get a bit obsessed by it. But I think most people probably don't care. No, but they all watch sci-fi films. I think we, we're curious. We, we, we may not make it into our profession. I remember reading a, a, a quote by uh, an author, Martin Amos, who, who said that you know the only difference between people like me, who are, who's a novelist, and, and other people is that we carry on doing that thing. Everyone's had a go at you know writing a story at some point, and probably get told by your teacher you had to or something. But uh, some people make it their career. Uh, it doesn't mean that that curiosity for telling stories or, you know, an anecdote with, with friends or down the pub or something isn't uh, storytelling. In the same way, I think we are curious about where we came from, how we got here. Um, that's a natural human uh, tendency. Do you think we need a definition for life? For, for example, you said, mentioned viruses are alive or memes are alive. Or how about if you just found, I don't know, far from equilibrium dissipative systems or only a vague storage facility mm -hmm. for information? Mm -hmm. or would tell me about your your experience dancing around the idea of do we or do we not need a concept? Yeah, I mean, definition. I think we've struggled. Lots of people have tried to come up with a definition or the definition. Um, there are a bunch of processes that are going to be useful. So if we understand something about um, metabolisms in, uh, in microbes, for example, that gives us some sort of indication about processes that, that are may be more complex than we see in some cases in uh, chemical systems. Uh, do we need to specifically define where, at what point a chemical system ceases to be chemical and is now biological? I, I don't think so. And, um, you don't think so? I don't think so, because some of those things happen in both a biological and a non-biological setting. I think if we understand processes, that's helpful, and we don't, it's the same problem as re really needing to identify the species. We've decided there is a thing called the species and we must identify it. And of course, it turns out biology doesn't really follow those rules. So while we might want to put things into a box and make it neat and tidy, it just doesn't end, end up doing that for us. So we we're thwarted. So you think that the, the concept of life, like the concept of species, is ambiguous? I think so. Yep. Okay, so you don't know what you're looking for. I think we would be better off if we had two examples, right? And, and the second example was uh, quite different from the first. We might have a better understanding of how to answer that question, uh, which is why digital-based life is quite fascinating to me personally, because it doesn't really work by uh, many of the standard rules that we think about in, in biological systems, with a chemistry-based metabolism and uh, polymers for uh, information storage and, and carrying out catalytic reactions and this, it's not going to be entirely the same. So that's fascinating because it could tell us a lot of things that are common uh, between the two that are not um, really not really part of those definitions, many of the definitions that we have. How about the, uh, the unit of selection uh, in biology? Do you think mm -hmm. that's a DNA or a chromosome or a cell or an individual or an ecosystem or, or, right. or well, Gaia? I think, or uh -huh. Well, I think it changes over time um, and it can operate on multiple levels, right? So, um, you know, at some point uh, you had circumstances that led to cooperation between molecules um, becoming, instead of single genes, becoming chromosomes. Um, or um, you know, uh, cells becoming multicellular, 
and so on. So that doesn't prevent the selection operating at the lower level, um, but it, if it can be stable at the higher level, then it becomes a, a new unit of selection. So what about I mean, Gaia? Gaia, um, I think the, the, there's an interesting aspect of it, which is that we, we do see um, that you know, biological systems have had a big effect on things like um, you know, the atmosphere, and they can tr uh, generate changes that may you know, enable other organisms to flourish or, or do badly, depending on the change. Um, the strong version of that hypothesis so sort of requires the whole system to be you know, a single unit of selection, and, and people have argued that if that were the case, the only way that would work is if you had sort of competing planets competing for the same resource. So, um, Do they you have can to compete for the same resource, or can they just compete for survival? Well, they'd have to be competing in some direct manner. So why? Um, or can you? Have well, that's the I guess that's the, the, the strong argument for how you'd have a um, a unit of selection when natural selection is operating. Yeah. Um, so you can still have a complex system where the outflows of, let's say, waste from one organism are impacting an, a group of organisms downstream, either uh, improving their circumstances or making it worse. Um, so those things are, um, uh, are, are quite interesting about, uh, you know, understanding planetary systems, but you don't have them, you don't have to require them to be a single unit of selection for that to be interesting. Well, let's suppose there are a million planets, all mm -hmm. of them independent, all of them have life, and then almost all of them, the life goes extinct. Mm -hmm. Now, what remains, is that a product of natural selection? I would not think so. That's just a, that's just a process. Uh, there's no, um, I mean, in, in the model of nat natural selection that we apply in biology, you have variation. Um, and you have variation uh, in this example. Yes, and so that's the same. But uh, the, the, natural, this, the, the natural selection in biological systems is about... Uh, you know, competition between individuals. And this doesn't need to have that to still, it could still be a form of evolution. People use the term evolution outside of biology, but they don't necessarily need to invoke natural selection. And in fact, you know, there are instances in biology where we say natural selection doesn't play a very strong role. So we tend to associate evolution with natural selection, but we don't need to. Oh, can you give us an example? Well, an example is drift, right? So um, individuals, drift. Uh, genetic drift or, um, you know, or island by ge geography. The luck a lucky individual happens to get blown onto an island. It's not that they were the fittest individual from their community. It was just a, a chance event. And then the population will... Um, increase from there. And you don't call that Darwinian evolution, you call well, that... Well, no, I mean, you, you, you do, because there are two modes there. One was um, descent with modification, so there are individuals cha changing over time in a, um, between you know, ancestor populations resemble but are not identical to the descendant populations. That's still uh, Darwinian. Uh, so he, the second mechanism that Darwin described was uh, evolution by natural selection. And I guess the way we see it is that it, it's, it's n not the case in biological systems that you have no natural selection. You can make mutations that will be so lethal that the individual can't survive and reproduce. Mm -hmm. But you can have uh, chance events being more dominant. So if a population is very small, chance events can be more important. Than I, th I think Doolittle wrote an article about, okay, there's a desert here. And there's mm -hmm. one species on this side, one species on this side and they go around, they change, they, and then this one dies out, then this one survives. Mm -hmm. And would you call it natural selection? Uh, not, the comparison is, is pointless if they're, um, you know, separated, if they're by a separated by a desert and really? they're not interacting. It's pointless. I would say, yeah, you wouldn't say that the, com the interaction between the two led, led to some outcome. These things happen in an independent so way. So you have to have interaction between the two, not just, ex just, not just survival. Well, I think uh, in that particular case, the way you're describing it, at least, it's, it's a chance thing, right? So one died out and the other didn't. Um, right. If there was some uh, particular, particular change, that, let's say an atmospheric change that impacted uh, the entire system on both sides of the desert, so change in, say, rainfall, and one was more uh, uh, adapted to lower um, you know, levels of water, then yes, then you can have natural selection. So it depends how you frame your... Your question. But even if they were next to each other, it would still be r random whether this one gets a mutation that allows it to outcompete this one. Yeah, well, the, the mutation, yeah, that's random. Oh, absolutely. Uh, but this, if the, it's here, it's, 
meant Darwinian evolution, and if it's on the other side of the desert, it's not. No, well, they're both Darwinian <laughs> evolution, but uh, I'm talking about two different processes. One is natural selection, and the other is just uh, change over time, right? And t change over time can be something that um, happens in the absence of uh, natural selection. So we have plenty of cases that we see. You know, most of the changes between your genome and my genome are just going to be neutral. They have real, very little effect on, on our physiology and so on. So we, we have those changes. Uh, occasionally, individuals get changes that lead to death before you know, adulthood or, or disease and so on. And those, those are whittled away because of the impact they have on the, the individual. Uh, but there are many changes that have that are of no consequence whatsoever. Is life getting more complex? Um, I think I, the, the argument's been made, and I broadly agree with it, there's nothing particularly about the process of evolution that uh, should lead to more complex systems. But if you just add time, and this is something Stephen Jay Gould has pointed out, um, if you start off at, at one particular point, so at some level position that we call simple, simple for example, then uh, you can move away from simple um, and keep keep going over over long enough periods of time. That doesn't mean that there is a um, an advantage or a disadvantage to greater complexity, but it can happen. If I gave you a hundred billion dollars with the caveat you had to spend it to try to answer the question, are we alone, how would you spend it? <laughs> Lots of money. A hundred billion dollars to answer the question of are we alone? To help answer the question. To help answer it. Um, I guess for me that, that's an awful lot of money. I would probably spend uh, uh, the money on trying to understand how how frequently, how can we get, can we get life um, appearing from some sort of chemical conditions in a, you know, a laboratory type setting? If I understand that there are, you know, if we find out there are 10 different ways or 100 different ways easily to get to, to life, that would tell us an awful lot. So from my background, that would be the approach I would take. Nothing for SETI? Um, no planetary missions? No big telescopes? Well, you're asking me how I would do it. I don't really know how to do any of the stuff that SETI does, but uh, I think what they're doing is very interesting, and it's great they're doing it. Um, I'm sure if you asked the SETI guys, they wouldn't think of a biological approach to answering the question. They'd get their radio telescopes out or whatever the next technology they could try out is. So. Do you think, would you spend any money with, for microscopes looking for nano-alien spacecraft? Nano-alien spacecraft. Where would, uh, microscopes. Microscopes to find nano alien spacecraft. You know, I don't, I don't think I would particularly plan that as a research program. Okay. How about uh, trying to figure out whether we're inside of an alien right now? With, yeah, I wouldn't even know how to begin looking at that, answering that question. I understand it's it's in principle plausible, but how to test that is oh. the tricky bit. A hundred billion is still a finite amount of money, <laughs> right? <laughs> now. One thing in astrobiology you hear a lot about is if we can identify some feature of life on Earth that has evolved multiple times independently, yep. then those become the best candidate features for what we should expect elsewhere. Do you think that's a good logic? And if so, how does that, what do you think about that? Um, well, I think it's important to see if we understand that something's evolved multiple times independently, then it tells us a lot about uh, whether it's it's difficult or easy to evolve, um, it depends what we what we mean by something. Um, so there may be some general principles that are very useful. So going back to your example of whether you'd expect to see other instances of of me out there, that's maybe too precise a, a, a target. Um, but it's very interesting to ask things like. Um, you know, would we expect to see, if given that we find life, would we expect to see um, predators and primary producers, for How example, heads? Or, or heads and intelligent oh. individual beings? Those are interesting questions. Yes. How about plants, animals, and fungi? As far as strategies, yes. As far as um, the but specifics, do we have the of, evolution of those things on Earth. Uh, I think if you s say w what do they do? So one plants they're, they're primary producers. They take some sort of 
Um, they take a, a source of um, non-biological energy and convert it. There are lots of different examples of that happening. So but cyanobacteria are plants then? Well, cyanobacteria are um, using the same chemistry to do, um, to do photosynthesis, right? And there are plenty of other um, prime mechanisms of primary production. So uh, using other chemical sources to uh, derive um, energy to run a cell. But that we can stay within bacteria and still have. We don't need to yeah, go to well multicellular Yeah, well you could argue you don't need um, multi Okay, so yeah, so if I just, th just thinking about the strategy of how they're, how they're harnessing um, resources in the environment around them, you'd say the strategy, chemically speaking, of being a primary producer has appeared multiple times. Uh, animals, um, we, uh, it depends what, what well, animal, animals have evolved once, but uh, we do see um, instances of things like um, predation, so a strategy, so there are plenty of pr predatory animals, for example, um, and, and in that I w you can say we see the same sort of thing appearing in other parts of the eukaryote tree, so grazers or, or um, predators and but so on. But you don't see eukaryotes more than once. But you, no, but but you, you see that strategy multiple times. Right, right? I see. So, so you expect that strategy, but that could just be purely, I don't know, viral or single well, cell. Well, maybe not viral, but certainly, I mean, viral is a strategy, right? Being a, being a parasite, mm -hmm. and we've seen parasitism evolve multiple times. So at that general level, I think answering that question without having to say, do I expect to see a plant that looks like a particular, you know, kind of tree, um, yeah, we can we can make specific, uh, very general statements. We can ask make more slightly more specific uh, statements based on environment. So, there are strategies that arid plants have that are different from plants in the tropics, uh, and some of those things, given a similar environment, we may expect to see. How about uh, human-like intelligence? If we ran yeah. the tape of life back, uh, let's say I don't know, mm -hmm. five hundred million years, four hundred million years, mm -hmm. then ran the tape again forward, do you think anything like humans would re-evolve? Um, I think so, actually. I think so. Because? And the reason I think so is that what we've worked out how to do is that we've worked out a generalist strategy. So instead of having specialist appendages like big fangs or um, armor, uh, uh, armor on us and so on, we've worked out, you know, we've got uh, tools in the way of our hands that are allowing us to do a, a fashion our environment in many, many different ways. So that's provided us with an opportunity to be very successful generalists. Uh, I can't see that it wouldn't be possible on the knowledge of current biology for other lineages of uh, life to adapt to um, their environments in a similar way. I don't think we're as special as we'd like to think. So let's think about the future. Instead of going into the past, let's go to the future. Let's say we kill ourselves in World War III and we wipe out all primates. Mm -hmm. uh, what organism will evolve into the technological species? In the intel you think there's an intelligence? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know the answer to that one, but I don't think it's as uh, implausible, especially given that we have uh, mammals uh, already. There's plenty of other lineages that have similar abilities to use their, you know, their front. Um, feet or their paws in a way that uh, allows them to um, manipulate uh, items in their environment. Um, so raccoons? Yeah, raccoons or even rats or mice will do these things. As, as so how long will you give them before they invent a camera and a rocket ship? <laughs> I'm not going to give them any time time limit. If they do it, that's great. I won't well, be around said, to see it. You said you wouldn't be surprised if they did. I wouldn't though. be surprised because I don't think it's as special as we, we, we think. We, if you think about uh, the lineage we came from and, and you say, okay, what about the, you know, um, the, the primates? There are plenty of primates that are not that different from, say, you know, raccoons. I mean, you look at things like lemurs and so on. There's, there's not that much... Uh, to say, oh yeah, it's really clear that the lineage that um, these guys are part of really is going to produce humans. They've simil there are similar features to, to those, uh, a, a range of different uh, mammalian groups. All right, what kind of aliens would you like to find? Nice ones, I think. Nice one. okay. <laughs> Do you have a favorite alien movie? <laughs> Do I have a favorite alien movie? Mm -hmm. um, with aliens. Yeah, uh, 
don't know really. I mean, I, I enjoy watching some of those things. I think it was it was fun. The um, the contact story was was uh, a lot of fun. So uh, in that movie Contact, mm. they ask, "Are we alone?" And the answer comes back, "Well, if we are, it's an awful waste of space." Mm -hmm, what mm -hmm. do you think of that comment? Well, flippant, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Yeah, I think until we until we have an answer, we we've got no real ability to uh, predict the uh, frequency of this, right? So it's either zero or one uh, at the moment. Do you have a favorite solution to Fermi's paradox? The idea of where is everybody? No, not particularly. All right. No. Um, let's see. What do you think of the public's or students' biggest misconceptions about the question: Are we alone? Hmm. I would say, well, I think we tend to think about it in religious terms. Uh, our solution to that is, is um, societies all around the globe is to think that there is some greater being that's, that's looking after us and that that's, that's our not alone, that there's a, some sort of godlike entity somewhere that we can, uh, we can ask questions of and, and get them to, to uh, do things that make our lives slightly better. And do you have any ad advice for students or people who are thinking about becoming astrobiologists? Um, okay, advice. No, not sure I have any really sage advice. I think it's a it's a field where. Uh, it, it probably more than many other areas you really get to exercise your curiosity. So if you like asking questions and pondering them, um, it's an exciting field. The real challenge is finding ways to, as with this question that we've been discussing today, is finding a way to move forward towards an answer. And that's it. That's the heart of it. Okay, and are we alone in the universe? Uh, I still think no, we're not. <laughs> but I don't have any evidence to back up my statement. But you have a hunch. I have a hunch, which is still not any evidence. But the <laughs> hunch is based on how easily you think life can get started. Yeah, that's that's the thing that I'm I'm curious about uh, pursuing is can we can we get to an answer to that question? But if you're we, not only curious, you have a hunch that it's not. If you were to if you were to ask me to to make a bet, I would bet in favor of that we would find multiple ways to to um, start life up, and that the parameters may be broader than we think. <laughs>